Good evening. This is Laws 12062 Alternative Dispute Resolution. It's week eight. We're dealing with Spencer Chapter 6, which deals with court-related um, or court-annexed ADR. But before we do that, it is feedback week. It's your opportunity to ask me questions, uh, give me some feedback in terms of the, the way in which the course has been conducted so far, but very importantly, provide me with an opportunity to ask questions or have an opportunity to ask questions about the assessment pieces and deal with practical as well as um, uh, theoretical issues. Now, online we have a number of people, um, so I'm going to encourage questions. I'm also going to provide you with some feedback as to how I like assessments to be set out and my perception of the need for students of this university to present their papers in a very professional way. Uh, what we want is to ensure there's a good impression right from the outset. And my sample document, which you'll find at the bottom of Moodle, called John Milburn Sample Document, is something that I'm going to refer to tonight. But before we do, can I invite anyone to ask me any questions about the assessment pieces that are coming up, and we've got a whole string of them now, essentially week after the uh, week after the next. Um, are there any issues that you have uh, foresee in relation to getting your assessment pieces in? Are there any problems? And uh, are there any issues that you wish to raise in relation to the course so far? Now, we have the chat facility, so you can ask your questions by the chat facility or unmute your microphone and come in and ask a question. Just to get us started, I think there was a question in relation to audio versus audio visual. And for the assessment pieces, um, my preference is audio visual assessment. That is for assessment piece number four, being the online presentation in relation to a solo mock mediation. And also assessment six, which is the group discussion. If you can't work the audio visual, then I will accept audio only, but it's not my preference. And the reason for that is that um, mediation is something which involves interaction, and we'd like to see the way in which you interact, and body language, eye contact, uh, things of that nature uh, do make a difference. So it's very difficult for me to make that proper assessment if I don't get to see the audio and the visual. But uh, it, as I say, if you can't, put in the audio and I'll do my best to make an appropriate adjustment so that you're not disadvantaged as a result of that. All right, so any questions so far? How's everyone, you know, what, what are the general thoughts about the course so far? I found it, um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, what I like to, John, um, is that how organised you are. Um, and I particularly found that with the, um, the course notes all being up early because in some of my other subjects, I've got to download them week by week, which means I've got to go away from here to somewhere else to actually print them off. Oh, so um, I really appreciate that all that material was there right at the beginning. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Appreciate that. Any other feedback or comments in relation to what we've done so far? There was some, some concern, uh, which I'm taking on board in relation to the duration of time that I gave you for the quiz. General commentary in terms of it wasn't enough time. It was always intended to be very tight, but perhaps too tight, and I'll consider that. If anyone wants to make any comments or in relation to that, um, you can do so uh, online through Moodle or you can send me an email privately if, uh, if you feel um, that that's preferred to johnm1492 at hotmail.com.au johnm1492 at hotmail.com.au all right well are there any questions about the logistics of what we're going to do what I expect of you in terms of the assessment pieces does anyone have any problems in understanding what's meant by uploading the presentation for the mock mediation, that is the introductory statement, uh, that's due on Monday the 8th of September. Everyone understands that? Now, 
in terms of do we have, yes, sorry, Margaret. Do we have to have a YouTube account to load it up to YouTube? No, I haven't set one up. Um, I suspect that some people already have their YouTube account. If um, if you have difficulty in setting up, or you'd have absolutely no desire to set up your own YouTube account, there are a couple of options. One is that I, I could perhaps set one up. Um, but the second is that you might like to upload straight to Moodle. And if you do that and you want to test it first, um, at the bottom page of the Moodle uh, opening page, directly below my John Milburn sample document, you'll see a forum which I've called Test Run Zoom Upload. And uh, I tested that last night. I uploaded a video which went for about 13 minutes, and that was fine. Um, it took a while, so do expect it to take a while. And I've uploaded the limit. Normally, it's a, a 5 meg limit. I've uploaded it to 100 um, meg. So there should be capacity. But I don't expect the video, certainly the first video should be about 5 minutes, maybe 10. Uh, the second one, um, try and restrict each the video to uh, 15 minutes. If you go over that because you've got two teams, well, that's fine, but just break it up into uh, to two different videos. There is a question in relation to the quiz. Did anyone get 15 out of 15 for the quiz? Uh, no, the best score from memory was 13. I think there was a 13, a couple of 12s and some 11s uh, for the quiz. Okay. Um, now, so you've got the test run for the Zoom. With the Zoom, um, I'd prefer it went through YouTube, uh, but if not, try Moodle and give it a go. If you have any problems, pop it onto the Moodle forum site because I may not be the best person from a technical point of view to help resolve any practical issues. Fellow students may be able to do that as well. Um, we need to get you organised into your groups. Now, at this stage, as you know, I'm asking for you to do that yourselves. So I think you have access to um, everyone who's doing the course. John says, well done to those who got 13. Um, there would have only been one person who got 13, and in fact, it may have been that the best score was 12, John. So I'd need to check that, sorry. But I think, some, I think one person got 13, and I think there were a couple of 12s from memory. All right, so with the groups, make sure you have your own groups organised. Try and do that now. Don't leave it to the last minute. Um, I fully expect that someone will find that they can't get a partner or they just don't have a partner, in which case what I'm going to do is ask for someone who's already submitted their paper to put up their hand and say, look, I'll, I'll help you, I'll be your foil, uh, even though I'm not being assessed on it. And if that doesn't work, then I'll come in and do it, but I'd rather be a completely independent uh, external observer. So if you have put in your assessment piece for... Number six, uh, well before the due date, which is the 22nd of September, it's not that far away, and you're willing to volunteer to help your fellow students by saying, if you don't have a partner, I'll assist you, uh, even though I'm not being assessed, then just put a note to that effect on Moodle if you would. Um, now, in terms of the written assessments, there's no other questions. I would like you to consider the sample document, which I placed. Now, can I just get an idea? Did anyone have a look at that sample document? Yes, of course, because I thought if I could try and copy the layout, I might do slightly better on my assessment number. Oh, which was it I put in? Three. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, and you've already submitted yours, John. So thank you. Um, the document is not just there for the setting out. It's there for some of the content as well. Um, so I'm just going to, if, you, if you've got access to that sample document, uh, I'd urge you just to have a look at that. And uh, I just want to go through a few points as well in relation to um, the way in which I like to see the set out and um, the way in which um, we should uh, deal with the... Um, some of the issues. All right, firstly, if you're going to put in a paper, and my apologies for those who have already put in their paper, I'm going to be talking in general terms. Question from Jessica. Um, I have it open, thank you. So you prefer Calabri, if that's the right pronunciation, rather than Times New Roman. 
Um, most definitely I do. And the reason I prefer Calabri or Arial is they are, to my mind, the more modern fonts. Look, in the 80s, um, we all used Times New Roman in practice. It was the accepted norm. But that has changed, and we don't see Times New Roman in practice very much at all anymore. And when we do, it tends to be from a very conservative, perhaps a little stodgy um, source. So if we want to present something which is perhaps modern, then we wouldn't use Times New Roman. Again, uh, purely personal choice. If you, if you think that Times New Roman is better, do that. But what I want to do is ensure that our papers from CQU really make a strong visual impression from the start. And, uh, and that's part of it. Uh, do paginate your paper. Do put in page numbers. I mean, they're easily done. Do make sure that you footnote your references. Um, we're using um, uh, Verdana. Uh, Verdana's fine, uh, John. That's, I think that's a modern-looking font. So that's fine. Um, what we're keen to do is make sure that everything is paginated, put in footnotes. And I trust that you all know how to footnote by using the word program. And if you don't, you need to learn that straight away. Um, so footnotes, go to the references tab in between the page layout and mailings. Uh, click on uh, the particular spot where you want to insert a reference. Go to the Reference tab, select Insert Footnote, and it will automatically number the um, citation. It'll take you to the bottom. When you get to the bottom, just tab so there's a gap between the little number and a cross. It'll put, come up in, I think, 10-point font and add the um, footnote there. Uh, don't footnote manually and don't put in endnotes. Put in footnotes. It's only a small point, but put in double spaces between sentences. In my view, that helps visually with the paper. You'll see all this in my sample document. It's the way that I've set it out. When you're referring to legislation or case law, make sure you type that in italics. Don't fall into the trap. In legal writing, we expect it to be written in italics, so go with that. that you know, some of these little points um, make the difference between the reader thinking that this person who has written knows what's expected um, as opposed to uh, not knowing what's expected. So the, in a case, the name of the parties is on, in italics um, and the, the other, otherwise the reference is not. So the litigants are in italics. The year and the citation is not typed in, in italics. When you're referring to um, legislation by using the term act, then capitalise the word act. Um, when quoting legislation or case law, don't quote the internet source, such as Ostley or Com Law. We don't care where you found the case. What we want to know is the name of the litigants and the legal citation. You'll remember back doing Introduction to Law, you probably came across the case of Humsey Hancock, comma, re. We don't want to know that it came from Ostley and the, and the internet address. What we want to know is Humsey-Hancock, comma, re. Square brackets, 2007, close square brackets, QSC 34. That's its legal citation. That's what I expect, and it should be in the form of a footnote rather than an endnote. Uh, do take care with your grammar. Very simply, have a look for the green and red underlining. It's, it's a clue from the word program that something is not right, so address it. You'd be amazed at the number of assignments that come through with misspelling or incorrect grammar, which could have easily been avoided by simply looking out for the prompts, which are part of the word program. I expect at this level in your university course that there will not be issues in relation to spelling and grammar. Do try to avoid legalese. Don't provide something which includes words such as here and after, here and before, or making reference to the said act or things of that nature. It's a form of legal writing which was very popular and very extensive, but we just don't do that anymore. We try to avoid that. We tried to write simply. And if you read my sample document, I would have given you some uh, reference to 
uh, simple wording used, I think, in that case um, by Lord Denning, which is an older piece of legal writing, which is now the norm. So simple words, plain language, generally speaking, short sentences. Be innovative. If you are able to use the program well enough to include flowcharts, then do that. Um, that's great. Um, if you look at a book and you open a page in a textbook and there's a graph or a flowchart, I'll bet that's the first thing you look at and that's what captures your attention. So why not do that in an assignment? You may need to learn the technical use of Word to, to come up with these things, um, but it's worth the effort and uh, it'll make your paper look more professional. You don't have to do that, but these are things that can really help. Make sure you follow the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. We should be all and truly, well and truly used to that by now. Um, otherwise, have a look at the sample document and as John has done, uh, feel free to simply use the formatting that I've used. Um, it's not the only formatting that will work, it's just a sample and um, it's my take on what we're doing these days. All right, I've been talking a lot to get through it. Uh, are there any questions in relation to those things? I won't go to the um, sample document. I think you've all seen it. Now, Jessica says, uh, just to confirm, you would prefer us to follow your sample document for layout and headings rather than strictly adhering to AGLC3. Uh, very good point, Jessica, no. Wherever possible, stick to the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Um, but the way in which I've set out is just my take on uh, the way in which a nice looking document would be set out. What I don't want to see is something that's overly busy in terms of visual appearance. So try to avoid a heading that is both in bold and underlined. You know, we don't do that sort of thing anymore. All right. Thanks, Jessica. All right, um, apart from Jessica's question there and John's question earlier, are there any other questions in terms of the layout or the procedure? Any issues there at all? You're all being very quiet tonight. Have I scared you? Okay, well, if there are no questions, um, I'll move on. Thanks, Margaret. And I'm going to be very brief in terms of commentary to do with Chapter 6, which is the prescribed reading for this week, in terms of David Spencer's principles of dispute resolution. You may have found this chapter quite dry, dealing with court annex dispute resolution. And I think the way to read, actively read chapters like this, which are heavily quoting passages of legislation, as they relate to different court processes, is to consider the what ifs and what would you do type questions that might flow from what's in the text. And I'll give you some ideas of that as we proceed. So if you'd like to follow me, I'm now at page 151, which is the first page of chapter six. I'm not going to cover, you'll be pleased to hear, I'm not going to cover everything and I'm not going to quote it verbatim. But the first part of the commentary deals with the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And that is a tribunal established to review administrative decisions by Commonwealth Government, its ministers, officials and authorities. And the AAT decides whether a correct decision has been made or whether a preferable decision should be substituted in accordance with the applicable law. And in that regard, the AAT will affirm, vary or set aside the original decision. Now, the only reason I'm mentioning that is that while it's not strictly related to ADR, that little passage very neatly describes the review process generally in terms of a merit merits review. So you might recall that where a decision is being challenged, there are essentially two ways to do it. The first is to appeal the decision. You're not happy that the magistrate found you guilty of speeding, so what do you do? You appeal that decision by section 222 by going to the district court and asking the district court to consider the appeal. On the other hand, we have a merits review. So if, for example, you were denied a blue card on your application by the Office of the Public Guardian, 
as it is now. It was the Commissioner for Child Guardian and Young People and Child Guardian. Um, if you're denied a blue card, you then make an application to QCAT, which is a tribunal where I'm a member, and you ask for that decision to be reviewed, uh, which means a merits review, which means that um, um, it's not an appeal. Uh, it's basically a, con a revision of the, the whole decision from scratch. And the, uh, the test is whether the preferable decision is to substitute or to affirm or vary or set aside the original decision. Um, all right, so Margaret has made comment in relation to the Native Title Act um, where trained mediators may mediate claim disputes. I ask because in the past I have not seen mediation conducted as being taught here, and I think that's why it wasn't successful. Okay, I, look, I haven't been involved in a mediation process through the Native Title Act, but um, no, I note your comments, Margaret. Thank you. All right, so just coming back to the AAT, um, there's section 34A, the president may direct an alternative dispute resolution process be used by the parties. Right, so when you read a sentence like that, it's all very bland and it's easy to flick over, but I'd, I'd ask that you try to actively read these sentences by asking the what-if questions. Now, the what-if question that came to my mind is this. Well, it's all very well for the president to direct in relation to the AAT that an alternative dispute resolution process is be, be used, but what type? So if you're a practitioner, you find yourself in a position where you have an AAT matter, where you want it to be solved uh, or resolved through ADR, you ask yourself, well, what type of mediation will I invite the president to order in that instance? So that's an example of where you need to be actively reading if you understand what I'm getting at. There's comments in relation to Fair Work Australia or the Fair Work Act, uh, which provides in that instance that the grievance procedures between the parties can be dealt with by way of mediation, conciliation, or in rare cases, arbitration. So we have the different options. And again, what comes to my mind are these sorts of questions. If I'm a practitioner involved in that dispute and I need the matter resolved through ADR, if I'm standing in front of a court or tribunal, what would I ask for? Would I ask for mediation? Would I ask for conciliation? Would I ask for arbitration? And if so, why? There's comments in relation to the Family Law Act. Many of you will be commenting on this in your assignment work. And um, as usual, the communications in a family dispute session may not be communicated outside the meeting to another party. However, there is an exception. We don't normally see the exception and that is except in certain circumstances pursuant to Section 10G of the Act or t Section 10J of the Act, in which case communications um, may be communicated outside the meeting to another party. Those exceptions will generally apply in circumstances where there is a risk to a party, uh, particularly children. So mediators are not always 100% bound by rules of confidentiality. The starting point to determine is to look at the legislation. Over the page, there's reference to section 13, or parts of 13, which deal with arbitration. And I must confess that arbitration isn't something that normally comes to my mind in terms of a recognised form of ADR for family law disputes. But it is an important rule and it provides that the court, with the permission of the parties, may order arbitration for any issues. You read that and you ask yourself, well, if I was a litigant, would I, pro pro would I propose arbitration? And if so, why? Or if I was on my feet in front of a family court judge and my opponent was pressing for arbitration, would I consent? Would I argue against that? Why would I do that? So when we read that the court can only do it with the permission of the parties, we have to think about, as practitioners, what would we do in those circumstances? And you might think about the role of the arbitrator and the powers of the arbitrator in making your decision. 
In this case, arbitration um, is a little different to normal arbitration, if I can use that term, because the arbitrator is entitled to refer any questions of law to the family court. Seems a bit odd. Generally speaking, the purpose of arbitration is that the arbitrator makes the decision and makes the decision in terms of legal matters and factual matters. So why then, in a family law context, would the arbitrator be entitled to refer questions of law to the family court? It almost begs the question, why do we need the arbitrator? Why not just go straight to the family court and ask the court to make the determination of law? Perhaps that logic is reinforced when one considers Section 13K of the Act, where the award, where the award made by the arbitrator may be set aside or affirmed or varied by the court. Once again, it begs the question, well, what's the point of arbitration in the first instance? And maybe that's why I have these concerns about arbitration in the family law context. Having said that, um, it has its place and um, uh, other practitioners may be much more uh, enthusiastic and ready to embrace arbitration. Jess, I'm just on page 154 at this stage, but I am moving pretty quickly through this, I'm sorry. Also on the, the question of arbitration on page 155 is this, arbitration may not be conducted for any matters arising under part seven, which include property disputes regarding maintenance. So now we have a situation where arbitration is subject to the arbitrator referring matters to the family court for a determination of law in circumstances where the award can be set aside or varied or, uh, or affirmed by the court and arbitration isn't available in property disputes regarding maintenance. Well, I hate to say it, but most property disputes will at least have some component which deals with spousal maintenance. Um, so if that's part of what uh, we're referring to, it just means that there's very limited opportunity, in my view, for arbitration in family law matters. Well, that's at page 155. At the bottom of 155 is um, some commentary in relation to registration and regulation of family dispute practitioners. I won't go into that because that's part of your assessment. I've been doing a lot of talking. There's not much coming up on the chat line. Are there any questions? Does anyone want to stop me, take issue with what I've said? ask for clarification, highlight areas where I've glossed over them that you think are important in the commentary so far. All right, I'll keep an eye on the chat line, but I'll continue. Federal Court of Australia, page 156. The court may, order, may by order refer proceedings to a mediator or arbitrator for mediation or arbitration. The thing that caught my eye about this is this. If the proceedings are being sent to a mediator, that's fine. I get that. But why would it be that in the federal court, the court would refer proceedings to an arbitrator for mediation? To me, that seems a bit odd. I can understand why you'd send the matter to an arbitrator for arbitration, but why send it to an arbitrator for mediation when you could send it to a mediator? So Jessica, so is arbitration the only one that they can use in court? Um, I'm not sure if we're talking about the family court or the federal court there, um, but the answer is no. Arbitration is available in the federal court and the family court as one of a number of options. Uh, the point that I was making about arbitration in the family court jurisdiction is I think it has some inherent difficulties as a result of what's contained in the legislation. Now, on page 158, we have commentary in relation to the Federal Magistrates Court. Uh, just be careful, that has now been superseded. It's now the Federal Circuit Court um, of Australia, and we don't have the Federal Magistrates Court anymore, but essentially one has overtaken the, the work of the other. All right. Um, that concludes the, all that I wanted to say about the federal jurisdiction in relation to court annexed dispute resolution procedures. 
and uh, the state jurisdiction has some commentary in relation to the District Court Act at page 180, Magistrates Court Act 182 and QCAT at 183. I'll just stop on QCAT. Um, we've talked before about QCAT in um, relation to retail shop lease disputes. QCAT has the power to refer the matter of a dispute to mediation initially. If that's unsuccessful, the matter can then be referred to a compulsory conference, which we call COCOs, uh, which is, uh, I've described it in the past, a COCO is a, a form of conciliation. So very similar to mediation, but mediation with some muscles, so to speak, where the um, uh, member here having control of the con compulsory conference has power to make directions and impose orders on the parties and also has the power to be more interventionist and make uh, suggestions to the parties carefully. Uh, so we talked about that in the context of conciliation. Also in uh, QCAT, there's a form of ADR which isn't mentioned here, but because it's relatively new and I've mentioned it briefly, is the um, matter of hybrid hearings, where following the hearing of a matter and the writing of a decision by the member, which is sealed in an envelope, um, and written essentially on the spot, the parties have an opportunity to engage in mediation uh, after the event as one final last ditch effort to try to resolve the matter. And it's only if that mediation effort following the hearing is unsuccessful that the mediator um, will morph back into the uh, person hearing the matter and read the decision. Are there any questions about that? concept of the hybrid hearing. I know I've been through that very quickly. Everyone understands what that's all about? All right. Um, there are, thanks Jessica, yes Margaret says yes, Jessica says yes. Um, as for the, the rest of the rules, I'll leave you to read those. Um, and as I said, it was going to be a, a brief overview tonight and that's all I propose to talk about in terms of chapter six. Next week, we have chapter number eight, and um, uh, that deals with legal issues generally. I'll try to keep the commentary fairly light uh, for the balance of the course. And the reason for that is that you're now very heavily involved in assessment pieces, and that understandably will need to take precedence. Just finally, in terms of assessment, you may be aware that my, I suppose what I, I like to make it clear is this. I, I don't like late assessments. Um, you won't probably get the quality of feedback from a late assessment that you might expect if your assessment is on time. You will be penalised in terms of a percentage per day for late assessment. You may suffer a situation where if your assessment is late, you'll be, you'll be asked to, to do an entirely different exercise and you won't be given long for that exercise. So if I start the process of getting feedback to, to people, which I try to do pretty quickly, and you're late, then don't be surprised if I then say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not accepting that and offer you something else. Now, don't think, however, that by being offered something else, that it's a free hit because you're still going to be penalised uh, the percentage uh, the, of, of the mark that you're late. And I'm not, I hate to say it, I'm not very generous with applications for extensions of time. I'm pretty firm on that. You need to have a very good reason and you will need to ensure that it's supported appropriately before you get an assessment extension. Sorry, other than that, I'm nice, but um, pretty tough on, on extensions. All right, any questions from what I've discussed so far? Any comments? As I said tonight, I was really keen to ensure that if you had any concerns about practically the practical issues of getting your assessments in and getting them in on time now's the time to speak um, but you will be expected to have looked at those technical issues those practical issues um, of making sure that your audio visual or if you have to audio matters uh, and your your written assignments get to me on time okay well just quickly looking to see if anyone has any issues 
they don't appear to. So I'll stop recording now and all the very best and we'll speak to you via Moodle and uh, Zoom next week.